people still coming from the other space. Um, this is our last time in the Haft, and then we're back in the Katie Murphy for the rest of the semester. Unless it changes, because you never know. But that is, that is the plan thus far. A couple of things to keep uh, in mind, just house cleaning things. Uh, first of all, um, next week we'll be back in the Katie Murphy. Uh, we are uh, with the founder of Art in Eden. Um, she also has a very interesting background in um, manufacturing, especially in the luxury sector. Uh, so she uh, will be a very interesting speaker. Uh, the following week, um, it's escaping my memory right now, but then uh, the week of Thanksgiving, we don't have class, okay? So that Monday before Thanksgiving, there is no class, but your uh, paper is due that day or that test, the, the uh, thing that you're gonna be reading on Blackboard and responding to. So just keep in mind that no class that day, but in lieu of a class, that's the assignment that's due, okay? Um, after that, uh, when we get back, we'll only have a few weeks left, so I just want to kind of put that in your ear so that if you are kind of thinking about your lecture prep questions and things like that, that you are kind of planning accordingly. So um, as you know, we had to switch dates uh, with Matthew Betcher a few weeks ago with, with Mark Drew, but so uh, Mark is finally here with us at the end of the month. I'm really pleased that he is here. Um, Mark was uh, born in Los Angeles, California, and then moved uh, from there to Plainfield, New Jersey. At an early age, um, he felt the need to use photography as a way to escape uh, the real world. Perhaps the radical tradition and spontaneity in Mark's photography was shaped by the characteristics of those early years in history. Um, and just as a side note, that's uh, Plainfield, which is where you lived, is where Irving Penn, the great photographer, uh, was born. Uh, Mark is well known for his sumptuous black and white pictures. He emphasizes provocation and absolute seduction, unveiled in each photographic vision with modesty and generosity. Mostly photographing the deeper human connection with elemental objects that surround us, Mark is an artist who's not afraid to remind us that there is an unbroken link between us and the visual world that surrounds us, as well as the mental world that lives within ourselves. Uh, Mark has had an extensive career in um, fashion photography as well as fine art photography. Um, so it's very interesting, the connection there, and we'll, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, today. But welcome, Mark, again to FIT. It's, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. OK. I know this space is always so more, more, much more formal than the Katie Murphy, but thank you for coming back. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to actually talk to you a lot. I know you have so many great images uh, set up for us today to show us of, of your work, especially in fine art photography. But let's, uh, let's just start a little bit with, with your background, your context, um, uh, how you got into photography. You've, you've had many hats in your life. <laughs> yes, this is true. Okay. So uh, basically, um, growing up in Plainfield, New Jersey, I was really drawn to uh, the visual arts uh, and using the tool of photography to express myself. And I used to dress my brothers and kind of dance around and play music. Uh, at the time, Madonna was, you know, all the rage, of course. Uh, George Michael, you know, of course. all those great uh, <laughs> artists. And uh, I would dress them myself and take pictures of them. At the time, I was using analog film, which I, I still use today, but it was a 35 millimeter camera that my uncle had given me. Um, uh, for like this sort of class I was taking at, at uh, school. So uh, that's, that was the start of my interest in photography. And then from there, I, I kind of got lost a little bit. Uh, I moved to Florida shortly after I had finished school. Um, I was in a position where I, I didn't have any money. I was homeless uh, at one point in my life. And uh, I thought to myself, okay, where was that passion, <laughs> excuse me, that passion, that drive? that I had and um, how can I find my way back to it? So uh, I found that art, uh, fine art photography and fashion photography was uh, kind of the way back for me. So uh, I, I bought a camera. Um, it was just a little, kind of a, like a, I think a three megapixel camera. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, that, was, that was kind of the start and in segueing back into it and finding myself again. But I had hit a rough spot in my life and I was uh, just kind of lost for a long time. So that, that helped, helped me find my way you were sort of trained or at least had been thinking more from a fine art perspective, but what was it about the fashion early on that sort of drew you there first before you sort of transitioned back into fine art? Well, initially, um, fashion photography, I mean, I'm very opinionated about this. I'm, of course, <laughs> of, you know, some people probably have a different uh, opinion, but uh, at that time, it allowed for more creativity and individual expression. 
you know? And uh, that's kind of what drew me towards it. I was thinking, oh wow, I can, I can have a career at this, I can express myself individually, and really um, uh, put my work out there in a way that I would feel as though people would want to tear the magazine uh, image from, from the, the book and, and put it on their wall. That was always my intention. And it so. sounds like even as a young kid, that connection between clothing, dressing up for the camera, taking photos was, was sort of integral to sort of this creative process. Yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. And I felt, at least for me anyway, I felt that was, that was more, um, more available to you with analog photography, which I love, you know, um, because there's more truth, at least for me. Um, Digital photography, I feel, is, I mean, as, as I might have expressed to you before, it's more of an ejaculation to me. It's just like, okay, you know, we take the shot, it's a, now let's Photoshop, you know. So, and what happens is after a while, everything becomes kind of muted because we're all using Photoshop, we're all, uh, you know, Gaussian blur, and we make this, the skin nice and, and smooth, and, you know, if you have a, a little bit of something tucked over here, you push it in there and liquefy and so forth. So, um... You know, I felt as though uh, analog photography allowed much more for a sort of um, a deeper, profound expression. And so that's why I never strayed too far. Of course, I got caught up in that wave. And then, of course, coming back after being away from it for a while and being lost, I didn't know where to start. So that's kind of what, what, what the, uh, the conflict was for me. So it's like I came from this analog world as a child, and that's where my memories were based. But then I, I fast forward ahead, and it's like, ah, everything is digital now, you know? So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's it. I'm just curious, because I wasn't going to ask this, but now that you brought it up, there's this, uh, did you feel like within analog, especially in the fashion space, that there was more of a humanity to it in the sense that there had to be more give and take? Because you're right, you, you can go through 5,000 images and Absolutely. Know, half hour, 40 minutes. Absolutely, days. absolutely. It's, it was, it's more about quality, and it's more about taking the time to think and see the light, compose and think about well, what is it that I, that, I want to, that I want to translate here uh, as opposed to just spraying my subject with images, you know? And what's interesting is that even today when I walk, say, in Central Park or something and I see a fashion shoot going on and I say to myself, okay, I'm looking and, and oftentimes the photographer is taking the shot and he's looking at his camera, taking the shot, looking at his camera. And not once is he ever really in the moment and connecting with his subject. It's all about snap, look, snap, look. And I can always tell when he or she has learned on digital because of that, you know? Whereas uh, analog photographers, they forget to look at the back of the screen, actually. So That's interesting. So it's like there's a presentness with the subject in front of you as opposed to the, the camera Absolutely, itself. because that's where everything is taking place, and that's where your connection needs to be as, as a photographer with, with the subject. So much so at times, I, when I uh, first got into digital photography, I remember that I would do a photo shoot for, say, a client, and I, I could connect with the model in a way where it just felt like we were the only two people in the room, you know, because there was just a sense of presence and awareness between the two of us. So. Do you think that that's sort of what got you hired early, in the early days, is that you were bringing something different to the table than perhaps other photographers? I think so. That and uh, the fact that I would always try to strive to create something unique um, in the sense that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that, that someone would want to take out of a magazine and, and put on their wall. So even architecturally, sometimes I would want to take uh, my subject and place him or her in a place where, where I found beauty, even if it was decay and this sort of thing, and then um, and, and add to that, that interest, and in, in, in photograph that in a beautiful way. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Before we jump into sort of the fine art piece, uh, you lived in Florida for a while, and then you came up to New York City. Uh, what was that like, that transition from Florida to New York? I mean, especially when you're coming as a fashion photographer. Sure, sure. Um, you know, in, in a sense, I guess it was kind of like coming back home for me, in a way. Um, and then just like, I, I would kind of uh, reference, say, Herb Ritz, for example, in this, is that when Herb Ritz was growing up and he was able to live and work in California, he was able to make his own voice, you know, without the influence of New York or the influence of London or Paris or any other uh, city. You know, now he was in L.A., and of course L.A. has a different flavor altogether, as we know, but he was able to add the elements which made L.A. L.A. and made her Brits her Brits, and that was the sun, the, the, the air, the openness, you know, and that sort of thing, um, and the light. So, that's that's uh, such an interesting concept. So yeah. to be a way to sort of 
get to know yourself and then come back. You know, you see this in fashion a lot, just you get sort of sucked into a, a particular cultural environment and, and become one with it, which, which can be, you can lead to success, certainly, if, if you are part of that zeitgeist, but perhaps also sort of doesn't allow space for your own personal um, creativity. Right. Absolutely, go to Williamsburg. <laughs> <laughs> everyone wants to be an individual but everyone looks the same exactly you know? yeah so yeah yeah um i'm curious then so so when did the transition happen for you uh of thinking you know what i want to go back more into the fine art i want to move sort of out of this fashion space and and maybe give us a little bit of uh, you know context for why you chose to leave i mean i know you still do it but you're real that's correct fine art. Uh, because i wanted to try try to find again my true self you know, um, and um, no matter how far I tried to stray away from fashion, there was always just something calling me back, calling me back. And it seemed uh, as though there was far less effort in, in, in expressing myself in the way I, I wanted to. And, and no matter, I feel as though, no matter how hard sometimes we try to get away from our truth, there's just something that shows in the images that you can't deny. And that's what I, I've always felt. And um, in fact, I was on set with a, a good friend of mine once, and we were doing a shoot for a magazine called um, Ohm Magazine, I think it was, or something like that, Vogue Ohm or something. I, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, he pointed out to me, he said, Mark, you know, if you look at your work here, for example, uh, because, of course, you know, I'm too close to it sometimes. He said, if you look at your work, uh, comparing um, some of the more creative stuff to where you're focused just purely on the fashion and conveying that, it's much better, it's much stronger. And once he, he brought that to light, I said, wow, he, he's, he's right. And, I, and then I could see it. So I said, let me just kind of continue down this and ride it and see where it takes me. So that, that was kind of it. I remember from, I think this is perhaps the last time you were here, that you also had sort of a fascination with, with male models um, and shooting males as opposed to females, which let's be honest, there just isn't that much of that in fashion. That's true. And I'm curious if there's a connection to what you were just saying about that, just sort of this having to look at things differently or in a different realm than your typical female model fashion shoot. Absolutely, absolutely. And for me, I think it was, a part of it was when I looked at the male form, I looked at the female form, I, obviously, I mean, I can find beauty in, in, in many things, you know, uh, in, in death and decay and, 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 and all sorts of things um, uh, besides the obvious. But in the male figure, I could connect with him in a way that I didn't have this barrier like I do with the female form whom I'm often maybe looking at the model and say, wow, she's so beautiful. And, you know, then I, I fall into that. Even it's happening on a subconscious level. Whereas with the male, I could move in and say, wow, he's, he's beautiful. And how I, I want to capture maybe how the light hits his chin, his jawline, and, and the beauty in his abs or, or the form of his body. And then what I would do is I would soften that up a little bit. And I would ask that the male get in touch with more of his feminine side. You know, and um, for example, I did a shoot in um, in uh, on Canal Street, and um, well, we were in a studio, but it was it was in Canal, and um, there was a radiator I remember seeing, and the the male model that we were shooting is gorgeous, gorgeous male model. I, what I wanted him to do, he was in tights. We were shooting for a company I can't remember the name unfortunately, but anyway, their their um, designs are very minimal. So what I did was uh, I took the model and I had him just wear just they were like a tights. And I had him sit on the floor close to the radiator so you could see the form and the lines of the radiator. And then I used, uh, he, you know, through here you have the serratus, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in good shape anyway. I don't have one now. But anyway, you could see the lines of the radiator and then the form of his body. And he looked like a dancer, but it was just so gorgeous how the radiator and his male form was against the, the steel. And it was just gorgeous. So if you open your eyes, you can see that, you know. Did it feel sort of that your clients weren't necessarily, I mean, you were clearly seeing something much bigger than just the male in the picture that, you know, that you were supposed to create for the client. Mm -hmm. um, is that part of sort of that transition into fine arts is just knowing that you had much more to say than just capturing Absolutely, product? absolutely. It was, it was taking place on a, on a more profound level. And, um, you know, oftentimes, especially today, the client dictates uh, what it is that they want to see. You're, you're on set, you have a digitech, you have the art director, you have everyone telling you in your ear 
what it is that they want and you kind of lose your own voice because everyone's saying okay well we, we don't like want this we don't like that and so forth and then and then of course the whole transforming the image and post-production is a whole nother thing in itself so I'm not poo-pooing uh, fashion and I'm not poo-pooing um, you know uh, fashion photography obviously not uh, it has its place but I just feel like for me uh, and and I can do I do see the trend going more towards analog uh, photography in some respects um, that that there's more of a, a truth there you know so uh, yeah yeah that word authenticity is being thrown around a lot these days about these brands trying to get back to their sort of authentic roots absolutely and showing a vulnerability as mm -hmm. well I think because you can connect with the consumer and show hey we're not perfect I mean none of us are right and when you're able to share that with another being you know you feel as though you've let down something. It's not always just about marketing, marketing, and oh, you know, here's here's uh, you know our brand, and oh, you should love us and like us and everything else. Mm -hmm. And it's really about um, what we stand for. I think you know. So when you decided to focus in on fine arts, you decided to separate them pretty clearly. Um, I did. Can you talk about why you felt that those two sort of areas of your life needed to be different? Um, the fine art from the fashion. Absolutely. I, I didn't want my fine art to be tainted by fashion or vice versa. And I felt as though I could go into my lab, quote unquote, and do purely what I wanted to do. And if that resonated with someone, then then I'm grateful, you know, and if not, I'm grateful, you know. And it wasn't about the commerce side of it where I always in the back of my mind had that pressure no matter what it was. And, and I've had occasions where, for example, we were doing a shoot for um, a magazine in California and the, um, the art director at the time, um, he was very much against me just starting the shoot, you know? And he said, oh, it, now their time, they're three hours behind. We were starting, I think our call time was like 7 a.m. or something, you know? And he said, oh, call me no matter, no matter what time it is. Just call me and make sure you put the stylist on the phone. I want to see all that's going on, you know? And I said, okay, you know, so. Time clicked and, you know, I had a set period of time that I had the studio for. And I said, I'm just going to do the shoot. He'll love the images, you know. So I do the shoot. I send the images to him. He loved them. But then he sent them to the editor and they did not like them at all. And because of the fact that I didn't let him know what we were shooting. I mean, he, he pretty much knew what type of, but the direction we were going in, he wanted his hand in every bit of it along the way. And then they didn't, they didn't run the shoot. It was for an editorial, actually. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. So... And it was at that start where I said, you know what, this is just, for me, it's getting out of control because, um, you know, they're dictating what I should and shouldn't do. If they like my work, why not just let me go with it? Where we can just take, I mean, gone are the days where you go with a stylist or someone and say, oh, we're just going to go out and see what we come back with, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that when you allow the artist or the creative individual to do that, it's, it's, it's coming from a, a pure place and a unique place, you know, that you see a little less of today, but hopefully we're going back in that direction. Isn't it interesting, though, that in photography or fashion or whatever art you're in, that you do get hired because of your point of view, but then often it is the people around you who try to move you in their direction. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So there, there is a struggle, right, to, to stay true to your own, your own sure, vision. Sure, sure. Yeah. So I know you have some wonderful images, so I, I, let's, let's jump to these real quick, if you don't mind, and, and take us through some of the images that you've chosen sure today. um this image uh was taken in williamsburg actually <laughs> and uh i went out i had a 35 millimeter camera um is old fujika uh camera that i had no sorry nikon actually f2 and um 35 millimeter and um i was walking i can't remember the streets i'm just really bad i'm sorry with streets and this sort of thing but uh, anyway um it was just kind of a random shot that i took here and i kind of wanted to play with the juxtaposition of the gentleman walking in the background and the Mercedes Benz in the foreground, you know, and the graffiti on the wall, uh, just how they were placed right in the graffiti and, and, and all of that. But I, I love the image. And at the time, I was shooting only black and white. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. Um, this image here, again, was taken with a 35 millimeter camera of mine. Um, I can't remember where I was. I think I was on a subway at the time. It's a rainy day, obviously, the Brooklyn Bridge is there. But I must be looking south. I must have been on the Manhattan Bridge because uh, that's second to Brooklyn now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. from what I remember. So uh, anyway, um, it just has a certain essence and dreaminess that I really loved about it. Um, so that's why I kind of keep this in my repertoire. Do you have your camera with you a lot? Or is this? do you tend to go out with a sort of a creative we, purpose? We talked about that before. Yeah. Um, I tend to go out with a certain 
mindset. Okay. Obviously, because it is film, you've got a lot more to carry and to consider. A lot of my cameras do not have a light meter inside, so I have mm -hmm. to carry an additional light meter and so forth. And the camera that I use today is a medium format Hasselblad, uh, as well as a Pentax 6x7, so it is a, it's a beast of a camera. So you really have to go out with the intention, with the it's full intention. Shooting, yeah. yeah, so, but uh, that's this. And then this image I took, I hope it's not too pixelated, but I took this with a 35 millimeter. It is a recent image. Um, it has a, a very vintagey feel to it, but um, I took this about nine years ago from the Empire State Building, I believe it was, and um, it's Manhattan. And I absolutely love the, the colors, um, you know, the muted tones of, of the entire uh, landscape, so this and uh, this was actually taken in Florida um, I what makes this interesting to me anyway um, was the rust this is a gas tank or something like that it's behind an old um, gas station and I saw this bottle sitting here and I wanted to kind of play with and see the light for what it was um, and the lines and how it was kind of created around the bottle and everything in this this particular image so um, this this was something that uh, was kind of one of my first fine art images. I'm, I'm sort of, at this stage in my life, I, I'm just kind of finding my way back, and I'm saying, okay, you know, which direction is this gonna go in? Because it takes time, obviously, to find your voice. Um, jump to a photo I took in Morocco uh, just about two years ago, I think it was in September. Um, I didn't know I was shooting color at the time. I just packed my bags. I went to North Africa with my backpack, uh, just some jeans. And uh, I think I had about seven rolls of film at the time and my 35 millimeter camera. Um, shooting in Morocco was um, very challenging um, because a lot of times uh, its citizens don't like their picture taken, obviously. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would photograph through reflections and storefronts and this sort of thing, you know. So uh, that was a part of... But part there's of a lot of camera. layers that in your photos of whether it's texture or sort of these different worlds existing. Is that something that you, you think you just sort of see by nature or is that something that you're looking for? Absolutely, uh, I am looking for that. And also um, I'm looking for a, a sort of a, a spatial awareness between my subject and those textures a lot of times. So that's what I hope to capture. And um, a lot of times, as I was saying in Morocco, because it was difficult for me to photograph there, I had to wait for the subject to enter the shot. And that was a technique that I learned from uh, uh, Cartier-Bresson, actually. So, um, yeah. Not from him personally, obviously, but <laughs> his work. That would be an amazing story in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. And this was uh, a woman who was um, sitting on the side of the road. The reason why I was able to capture this uh, image is because I, I had a local guide with me who asked her if I could, and, and I, I gave her a few... Um, um, Dharma, I think is the currency that they use. I can't remember. I think it's Dharma. But uh, anyway. It's yeah. so fascinating, too, that some of these are very much about clothing, even though this is not a fashion shoot. Yes, absolutely. There's so much life in these. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, and here's another one. Uh, just a gentleman. Um, I did send these to uh, Condé Nast Traveler, and um, they, they really love the images, but unfortunately, they just ran a story on Morocco, on Marrakesh, uh, which is where I was, so they couldn't run the story. But uh, yeah, it was also a very spiritual uh, moment for me in my life, and um, I just kind of wanted to put myself out there in a way where I just wanted to create um, from just purity, you know, and see what I came back with. And so. in this case, you're sort of in a space, geographically speaking, or even culturally speaking, that's very different than mm -hmm. your own. Right. Yeah, is that, do you find that different shooting in a space like that as opposed to New York where you're sort of part of the community? I find it easier. Um, finding, I know, you know, at least for me creatively, uh, you have to feel a, a sort of connection with, with your surroundings, I, I feel. And um, it is important to me to have that connection um, in one way or another or a disconnection. Um, which is absolutely uh, what I'm looking for because we sort of get um, used to our surroundings and we don't see it for the beauty that surrounds us and, and, and that we're in, immersed in uh, every day. So I find myself always wanting to be an internal visitor, I would say, you know.
So uh, this is in the south of France. Uh, I went running with the bulls. This was around the same time uh, that I was in Morocco. Actually, I left for Morocco after I left uh, for, for this, uh, this shoot here. And it was in a town called uh, Montano. Mm -hmm. And it's near Vieques, uh, France, uh, which is close to uh, Montpellier. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so this was really interesting. And back to Morocco, this was a little girl who was running down the street. And she was sort of playing with me. She was running back and forth. And um, I was just waiting for a moment. Her house, her door was actually right on the right-hand side. So I was really very lucky to capture this shot. And it was, again, with my 35 millimeter. And it, it has kind of a ghostly uh, appeal to it, which I absolutely love, even though it's really blown out. You know, she just happened to land right in that bright spot, you know? But I love this sort of false negative kind of going on yeah. here, the spatialness of it, and then uh, how she's just very, uh, appears, you know? I don't know, almost like a ghost. And I, I, I love that about this, that's why I chose this. So, but I had one moment, and that was it. So, and this is just really more about the architecture and um, the fine details in the country and, and how beautiful it is, really. So it takes you back, you know? Um, here is about, uh, I love this photograph, it's probably one of my favorite that I took in Morocco. It's about the fluidity and, um, again, spatial awareness and how the subject is kind of going away from me but also entering into an unknown space with a lot of interest in the arc and the flow and everything of what she's wearing and I, I, I love it. I just, I think it's beautiful, so. You do have a very s strong sense for the clothing in all of these photos as well. It Correct. I'm sure that comes from the fashion. <laughs> it does, it does. And even when I try to avoid it and then a subconscious level, it absolutely truth does. Keeps coming yeah. back to you. Yeah. Right. So and then again here are the markets and so forth and the Medina. So in the morning you can go out and um especially depending on which morning it is, uh, Sunday morning, Saturday mornings and, and it's really empty, you know. So before everyone rises. Um Jumping uh, to New York, I'm sorry, I don't have these in any kind of particular order, but jumping to New York, I was going down, I think it was to Brighton Beach, and I was in the front of the subway. Um, actually, no, I stopped and got off the subway now that I think about it, and I just love how the buildings kind of dance on the horizon. That's kind of how I chose this image, but it's uh, really grainy and pixelated, which I love the effect because you don't see too much of the detail, just kind of these, uh, whoops, just kind of these uh, buildings, you know. So, yeah, that was it. I'll kind of move ahead a little bit to uh, to some of the newer stuff. Um, this is a the first series of a of a journey that I went on. I would say creatively with uh, textures, beauty, color, particularly because I started out a lot of my work with um, black and white. Um, I just uh, there was a recent um, group exhibition that I had in uh, the West Village which included one of the series from, um, one of the photos from this series of work that I did. And um, this series um, really is about, um, it's a little hard to explain, but it's about the beauty um, of our skin mm -hmm. and the differences that we all have. Um, and it's called Skin Deep is the series uh, title. And um, I took decaying fruit, uh, whether it's papaya or apple or some lychee and this sort of thing. And what I would do is I would impose a, a, a beautiful uh, creature or a creature that we would perceive as something that was beautiful and bright um, and, and then and use that with uh, some of the decaying objects that I had. So. This is, I, I don't know if this is going to be a connection that makes sense, but mm -hmm. it, there is an Irving Penn quality to this sort of fleshiness and shape I, I guess yes I guess one would say um, and this sort of sort of has a sort of sexual connotation for me as well too you know um, you have to kind of step back from it to see it but yeah. it does yeah yeah and it sort of reminds me a little bit of um, what was the movie with um, Anthony Hopkins um, oh, I forgot the movie where he's uh, where he eats people where he's this kind of serial killer Silence of the Lambs Silence of the Lambs yeah <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. the butterfly sort of, yes. the butterfly yeah yeah definitely so, yeah, that was one. And then this is the actual shot that was on exhibit there. And uh, this is kind of a praying mantis among within the lychee. But I was really thrilled um, to find these, these bugs. I, I didn't find them. I, I actually uh, bought this. But uh, to find that the colors and the tones and the beauty that they represented went well with some of the fruit and things that I had uh, 
you know, at, at my disposal. So I was really excited. How much time do you spend? Um, I mean, when we're not talking about digital, and we're actually sure. talking about shooting analog. How much time do you spend lighting a subject like you know, this? You know, every single one of these shots, as well as a lot of my fine artwork, is shooting with all natural light. Really? So it's there. It's you just have to see it. And uh -huh. in terms of the post production, none. I don't spend uh, I'm two seconds maybe removing some dust and that's it after the image has been scanned and that, and that is truly it. And if you look on the left wing, for example, as you over here on the left wing, you can see there's a little bit of dust on his second wing uh, down from there and, uh, and I leave it. I don't mess with it too much, you know, because I think that that, is, uh, that defeats the purpose of uh, analog. So, yeah, so that's the one. And then this is another one. Uh, that I shot. This is a rotten apple, and I and I take what I do is I, I let the the fruit uh, ferment and decay in a closed container, mm -hmm. and then I uh, kind of find the the bug or, or the object that I feel would match with it, and uh, it, it beautifully it it just seems that a lot of these creatures just seem to really lend themselves to to it all. So what, why do I'm excited. You it, it, they're so beautiful, and I'm. I, Thank you. Maybe this is a philosophical question to a degree, but we, I look at this, and of course think it's very beautiful. But then, if you like translate that to human flesh, like this idea of decaying and growing old, doesn't seem terribly beautiful. The eye. It's about death, really, yeah. you know, and that the, I find there's beauty in that because it's just another form. It's just another form of uh, our existence. I feel, you know, so that's that's kind of what it is for me. So there's a lot of judgment going on today, I think, and. Um, that was that was kind of where I started with in all this, and it's not apparent at first, but this is sort of what the series is about, and and how we can all be um, thin-skinned, and that, and that's why I titled this series such. So this is a a beetle that's uh, you know obviously on a, a decayed uh, orange, and uh, yeah, so that's that. Mm. These, uh, I wish I could say that I found these uh, <laughs> worms, but I didn't. Um, these are, are actually bought. <laughs> so it would just be too hard for me to find something like this. So uh, yeah, so the mealworms or something, I think they're called there, yeah. So, and I put a little pepper, a little pepper on there with it. So maybe not something you'd want to hang on your wall, but uh, you know, interesting, I find the, the color and the tones, you know, so. And this, this creature, oh, I'm just uh, so blown away at the, as you can see on the wings, how it matched the, um, the mango. I j it just was, was stunned by that. So anyway, and uh, just for the sake of adding a little bit more texture to it, that's why I kind of pulled away over here in the top right-hand corner. And that's, that was the intention in this uh, photo here. So uh, yeah. And I wish I knew that I was trying to remember the scientific name for each bug, but I, I just can't. I mean, the minute I, I look it up, it was, it was gone within seconds, so not my thing. So now moving into some of the black and whites that I had taken, um, I, I, this was, it's, I, I found this in Prospect Park. It feels like the tree is almost running in a sense, you know. Um, but what happened was uh, when I first started out with a lot of the, um, the bugs and, and nature and this sort of thing, it led me to explore more my surroundings. And as, as you mentioned in um, the lead-in to uh, my work is that um, this is where I'm starting to explore uh, my humanness among our nature and what that means to me and, and, and us as, as human beings. So um, that's the journey that I've been going on with a lot of the nature walks that I go on and taking my medium format camera and that's what's been leading me uh, on a lot of trips to the south of France and <laughs> wherever else I go. So. I and mean, one of the amazing things about this photo is that it is in Prospect Park, that it's in New York, right? Because yes. Because this does feel so lost somewhere. Right, you know, right. Yeah, yeah. It really, you know, I, I, I just, I have to open my eyes and, and, and see um, all that is around us and the richness that, that, that we have um, right here in our own backyard. So I'm really thrilled to be able to express that and look for that. Um, sometimes it can be right in the, the middle of uh, the urban jungle, you know, and we don't see it unless we stop and, and take the time to do that. And I feel as though film lends itself to that because you really have to think about what you're shooting. Whereas when I'm shooting digital, I mean, I find myself guilty of doing this also. It's just, that I, oh, okay, I can fix it in post, or I take so many shots, you know. But to find this shot, um, it took a lot more thought, 
and I took only two photographs of this. So um, if it's there later, it's there. If it's not, it's not. And it's like Christmas to me, really. The, the, the time that I take to find the place uh, after developing the film, which I do myself, uh, scanning it and seeing what I have, um, spending the time in the dark room and, and all of that. So, yeah. So now this is a very recent series that I did that um, um, it was really kind of a, a gaffe, I guess you would say. But I took fish, uh, which obviously, um, you know, dead fish at that, um, that could smell, no? And I put them with these beautiful bouquet, bouquets of, of flowers and this sort of thing, and I, I just kind of wanted to play around with it, and I've gotten a really great response from this. Um, and um, it is a, a fine art uh, series that I did with, you know, a lot of dead fish, and uh, just kind of played with the color. But um, there's no narrative here. It's, it's whatever you, you find in it, so. And here's another one. I, I love the colors myself. So, You play a lot with just sort of these natural sort of textures and colors that, mm -hmm. you know, the, whether it's in the butterfly or the fish. Um, what was sort of the impetus p of putting fish and flowers together? Was, was it clearly a juxtaposition you were going after? Or was it really related to color and texture or both? It was a little bit of both, but it was even something a little bit different from that, which was that here you have these things that smell, mm -hmm. if you have them out too long, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the flowers, which smell good by all accounts, right? And mixing the two, and I found that hilarious. You know, I found it kind of funny. Um, and there was no other forethought other than that. You know, it just came to me. And I'm in this market in um, Canal on Canal Street, and I'm buying fish, you know. And um, I'm a bit OCD, as I might have mentioned to you before. So when I leave, I have this sanitizer. I'm, like, cleaning my <laughs> feet and my hands, and I just hate it, you know. But at the same time, I'm enjoying it, you know. So I'm, I'm back in my studio. I'm laying the fish out, and I've got these gloves on, and I'm just kind of propping my camera. I have a boom arm that comes out over top of them, and I have some nice light coming into the studio. And... Um, um, I'm playing my music, and, and it's kind of like the time when I was dressing my brothers and dancing with them, only with fish and flowers <laughs> this time, you know? So, uh, yeah. Well, it's fascinating that you're capturing an aural, like a, a smell in your photos. That's I am thinking about scent yeah. in this. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, that was that. And uh, here's another one. And I couldn't tell you again what kind of fish they are, but I, I love them. I, I love their shape and their form. And, uh, you know, how they're kind of just laid out in this display with the bouquet. So, you know. And, um, you know, I'm not really thinking at this point, would someone want to hang this on their wall? Because I'm doing it completely for myself. And if they connect with it, I'm, I'm elated. But if not, you know, that's okay too. So. And uh, this, again, is in Prospect Park. Um, and uh, what I love about this is early morning, uh, 6 a.m., last, uh, I believe it was uh, spring, last spring. And um, what I really love about this is how the the fallen timber is just kind of playing in, in the forefront of all the foliage behind it, you know? And uh, that's what drew me to this and the light. So, uh, yeah. So, that was really it. This is part of a, a recent series um, that I did, and I'm, I'm playing with a lot of objects, um, color, tones, um, textures again. And um, it's called Where Do We Go From Here? Where Do We Go Now? Sorry, Where Do We Go Now? And Where Do We Go Now is really about a certain spatial awareness for me. Um, this image in particular doesn't really have too much significance or depth or any sort of cerebral play going on too much. But what it was that I loved about this was the color, the tones, and that's kind of what I was bringing um, through this and this. Um, and again, that sort of spatial awareness. Um, wait, I want to kind of fast forward. This guy was supposed to be with the others, but here again we have that sort of um, shape and form in this. Um, but I want to get kind of forward to some others that I had with, that, okay. with the other, if that's yeah. okay. So this is a bit more abstract of my work. Um, this, again, is with form. Um, it is a part of a nude series that I did when I first started shooting medium format. Um, again, I'm kind of exploring here. It even looks like a fruit or uh, some sort of um, um, potato. If you look at the potato that I had in the previous, this is kind of sort of the, the play, you know, with the sweet potato. 
that I that I had going on with this, you know, or an apple or or something like that. But uh, it's it's a butt, as you can tell, you know. <laughs> so uh, that's that's kind of what I was doing here, just human form, you know, and getting more into a, a micro sort of way of expressing my 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 work. So and here I kind of step back. I wanted to use her body and form as a landscape, almost like you know, here. So. Yeah, and here again is form and the beauty in all form and, and things. So, uh, yeah. So that's about it. And here from behind, again. Such a, the skin has such an mm -hmm. interesting quality to it in yeah, these photos. Yeah, thank you. Is that natural light as well? It's all natural light. Wow. Uh, this was shot in a, in a friend's uh, studio space. And uh, again, I use my Hasselblad, which is a square format. Yeah. So just in that in in itself, you have to approach your subject uh, somewhat different, you know. So yeah. So again, going back to uh, form, this was literally shot in Washington Square Park, and I feel like with this photo, I'm so far away from everything. But there's a beautiful tree there that I have explored every angle of, all times of the day and night, <laughs> and um, this is uh, this is the result of that. So it kind of takes me to like a never never land, and that this is what I, I really love about this this photograph. So yeah. Do you have certain subjects, meaning you know a tree or an object that you you, you find yourself going back to? Absolutely, because yeah. it always presents itself something different each time, and even different seasons of the year, um, you're going to see something completely different. And I know we all see that if we go to Central Park in the winter, or if we go in the spring, and so forth. There's definitely a different, uh, a different uh, expression. So, and here we go again. This is the exact same tree, only I'm working my way around it more on the east side, you know. So, and uh, same time of the day, but on a different day, and on on another side of the tree. So, and um, some people have said to me, oh, this looks like what, you know, cancer would look like, for example, if you could visualize what, you know, and, and I find that kind of beautiful in a way, personally, you know, there's an awkwardness to it, it's, it's kind of makes me feel maybe a little uneasy, but, um, but I find beauty in that, you know. So, and this from that series is my absolute favorite, I, I call it tree portraits, um, for lack of a, a more profound maybe title, but I, I, that's exactly what it is because I feel as though they're presenting something to me in which I, I want to capture in a way. And this sort of has a, a, a sort of quality where, again, it's distant, it kind of has this um, explorative sort of feeling to it. So, yeah. Same tree, by the way. And same tree. And this, believe it or not, is Central Park. There are people all around me when I when I kind of uh, when I saw this, and I have to be in the right headspace, obviously, you know, just taking my time, slow down, just open my eyes, and I had to wait for someone to kind of get off the rocks on the other side, and and then I photographed this. But it reminds me of maybe some rock structure or form in Colorado, for example. And if you stood on this rock. Um, you would literally probably tower up to the sky. It's not that big, really. And the way I photographed it, or the way the camera allowed me to photograph it, was in a way where it kind of has this sort of, um, I don't know, never-ending um, visual aspect to it, I think. I, I, that's what I see. I don't yeah, know. It feels like I, you're I in know. a desert. Yeah. You feel, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so, and it sort of has a fluid, a fluid appeal as well. So, but uh, again, trees. Um, I'll kind of move past this. This was in Central Park as well. And um, this to me feels very masculine because of that, that rod coming out. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back. And, and what I did, I have to tell you. So I photographed this and for three months it haunted me. I, I love it. And, and what it was is that, I, I don't know, there's something to it that I felt like it was kind of this um, vibrant uh, sort of... Um, I don't, like I said, Max, just sexuality again yeah. to it or whatever. Well, what I did was I had this jacket that has like this orange band around it and has this iridescent look. You would mistaken me maybe for someone who works, uh, you know, on the on this this you know the the uh, streets and so forth. You know, right. uh, putting cones and and so <laughs> forth. So I put that jacket on, and in the winter time 
I called my brother who is, he's a contractor, so he knows about tools and stuff. I'm not good with that. But I told him, I want to go get this. I've got to go get this. It's in its structure in Central Park, and I want to go, I want it. <laughs> because I want to create a, a sculpture from this. And so I was going to go out with a handsaw and take this out of the stone structure. And he said, you can't do that. It's not going to work, first of all. You'll be there for months. And secondly, you know, you're not supposed to do that kind of right. stuff. Well, I had to have this thing. I went out and I bought a uh, electric, not electric, but you charge it and it just kind of, you know. So I put this jacket on and I went to the park and I kind of stood there as though I was supposed to be there. And I saw this thing out of the stone and I own it now. I mean, <laughs> so it's yours. I have it. Yeah. So it's at home, yeah. And um, I'm really inspired by it. I just had to have it and risk whatever I had to risk, being arrested or whatever, <laughs> to have that. So you go I through a lot it, of effort know. to steal. I did, I yeah. did. And, and I want to use that as part of my sculpture um, <laughs> I, I have. So anyway, but, but that's that. Um, this was part of a series of work that I did. Um, it's somewhat commercial, I feel. It's, it has a sort of commercial element to it. I wanted, again, to kind of play with textures. I was very inspired by Irving Penn. He did a series of work with cigarettes. And I just absolutely love it and found objects. Um, this, believe it or not, I found, I think I've, I've gotten this one in, in France. I got this in Paris when I was in Paris. I think. It says, be safe, keep cover closed, which is in English. So I'm thinking... It was either there or in Brooklyn. I, I can't remember, but it is in English. Uh, so it, it, it quite possibly could have been there. But The anyway. French like things so. in English. It's sexy. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So, But that was part of a series of that. This was a um, fountain in um, uh, Central Park once again. And I wanted to kind of play with uh, the form of the fountain and how it came over into the frame. What was going on in my mind at the time was the form of the fountain, how I can kind of fall down into it. Um, I enjoyed the leaf down here on the in the bottom part of the photograph. Um, also how the light was kind of um, on the top part of, of the, the frame. So these are all things that are kind of going on in my mind at the time, which maybe I wouldn't have thought about if I was shooting digital. And how to come over that in a way that fit into the, the, the frame and compositionally how it could be interesting. Mm -hmm. The one thing that bothered me was this manhole cover on this side that bothered me a little bit because the arm comes over and I wanted more minimal um, uh, appeal in, in the shot. So, but, um, but it doesn't bother me too much. It doesn't bother me too much. So, but anyway, so that's, that's that. And uh, this is uh, me being um, snowed in uh, during our storm last year and thinking I'm very inspired. What can I photograph in my house that, um, that I love? And um, I thought about uh, Andre Kertesz, uh, who's one of the photographers whose work I absolutely love. And um, uh, I thought, ah, you know, I'm going to use objects. And, and that was it. And so forks and play with the light. All again, you know, natural lighting. And uh, I used a kind of a black felt piece behind and shot maybe about two stops down from uh, what the exposure called for. Right. So, yeah. so that was that. And uh, then the spoons. And what, what, you know, for me anyway, you know, I mean, I'm showing photographs here and we're talking about the photographs and what's going on cerebrally and all these other kind of things. But it's really... As I, I was saying earlier, it's really about a personal journey, I think, um, for all of us, at least in my opinion. And whether you're in design, whether you're in movies, whether you're, no matter what it is, I think we all go through that. And what I like to do is draw on the connection between the objects that we are photographing, us personally, and then the journey that brings us to those objects and why our approach was what it was. And... Um, I think that that's very, very important. And uh, so it's really more about that and, and, and us um, as individuals than it, than it is much more about the, the objects. If you've been showing so. some of these photos, I've also been kind of thinking to myself how these could even extend in their journey further, let's say for a fashion designer who might look at this and, and wonder how you know, this texture or this image could be adapted into a textile or into a dress. And I'm cu curious if that's 
do you think about it from that perspective that this this could have a life somewhere that it could inspire somebody? I'm not not directly. Perhaps it's happening on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, why not have a uh, a kimono, okay, with spoons on it or forks or uh, I don't know chopsticks. I I don't know. You know, but of course, and we draw that inspiration from everyday things in our lives, and um, and that's what it is for me. But you have to stop and really take the time to see that, to um, be open to that, um, and create the space, as we were talking about earlier, to allow that to come in. Because I know a lot of times we'll be on the subway or commuting or whatever the case may be, and um, we see something that just catches our eye, and um, we have to stay true to that. Um, either you take notes or you journal it with your phone or whatever the case may be and come back to it later or use it to reference uh, something or another um, and, and put that into the salad of our creativity, which I think is very important. There's this kind of reciprocity that's going on, sort of the circle between the viewer and the, the subject and back and forth, so yes, to speak. Yes, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yeah, so... Yeah, so that's a part of this. This was, uh, obviously, I was shot in uh, France. Uh, that's a Citroën, I think. I can never pronounce the name of that car, <laughs> but that's what it is. So, And I love the lines on this particularly. So I think there's also a commercial uh, commercial element to this in a sense, but yeah. So that's, that's that. Uh, this, as abstract as it looks, it is shot from a bridge uh, in the south of France, and it was uh, Le Pont du Diable, the Devil's uh, Bridge. And uh, I'm up above, and these are these rock structures and forms that are into the water. Now, I was really shocked um, when I saw this, when I developed it, because the water is so black, which is over here on the right-hand side in this sort of negative space. And I thought it would be uh, much more much more pronounced as to what, what it was over here. But um, I, I really wasn't uh, planning that, and I love it. It just how it kind of hits into the frame. To me, it sort of comes out of nowhere, almost like a meteor. It's like, pow, you know, and it's just there. So, and that's what I take away from it visually. So, uh, yeah, there's that. And then again, these are uh, me um, going out and kind of exploring sort of the natural elements which we live in. Um, this was taken in Prospect Park. This is uh, a tree that was split open, and I saw this, and uh, I saw this while I was running one day, actually, and I, I said, I've got to come back to this, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of one of the series that I did with these, and uh, yeah, I love it. So that was kind of it. Again, textures, you know, so, but, uh, but you know, who would have ever known? You know, you see these kind of curly trees. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's that's really it. And uh, this is um, part of a series that I did. Um, it's called uh, the 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 line between. Yeah, the line between. And this is a sidewalk. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, and um, it's uh, in Carroll Gardens. And uh, this is kind of the pavement structure after a rainy day. And I was looking down. I'm headed to get my coffee. And again, I passed right by this, and it just drew me in, the richness of it, the pavement, the depths, and the lines. And I got my coffee, went back to my apartment, and came back out, and luckily, I got a, a lot of beautiful shots of this before it started to pour down raining, and I was setting up my tripod on the street and just kind of capturing, you know, a lot of these uh, structures. So, but um, that was really it. But I was inspired by the lines and the brokenness of it all, you know, so... That was another shot. Do you find that this well. sort of comes naturally to you, or is this something that you had to work on to sort of be open to these moments of inspiration or You know, connection? interestingly, it was a journey. Um, it started with the bugs and the matches. And one might ask, well, how the hell did that happen? Well, what it was is it caused me to kind of slow down my approach a little bit. In fashion photography, I was always looking at the greater picture, you know? And so what I decided to do is, because I was doing this, in my own time, in my own way, with my own self-expression, I said, I want to go deeper within. And to do that, I want to get closer. I want to get closer to my subject. I want to look deeper into that light, into the objects and what's going on there, you know? And um, just as a result of starting with those bugs and really taking my time and presence, I started to see the world much closer and, and much more... Um, intimate, I guess you would say. So that's kind of uh, how this process started with me, you know. 
And sometimes I ask myself, what the fuck are you thinking? Like, what are you thinking? You know? Right. You, you're shooting. I, you know, I photograph sometimes. Yeah, I see beauty like in dog shit or whatever. <laughs> it's like, you know, who would have ever. But, but if you look close enough, you know, there's a form. There's the light. There is uh, how it's uh, on the street or what, whatever it might be, you know? Yeah. So th this is all around us. And um, why not? So I don't know. To me, I see a wave, you know, and I love how the light is coming across and how it's darker here just as it did start to rain and this sort of thing. And um, I don't know. I don't know if others see that, but it's just, you know, for me. And I hope that there's a connection. So, yeah. And uh, this is a series that I had done. Um, I wanted to sort of show here the muted tones with um, decayed and dead flowers. Um, I found a beauty in that. I was actually in a uh, place that I uh, developed my film called Kiwanis Dark Room. And uh, I, I absolutely love the studio there, but there were some dead flowers and a lot of petals laying around. And I, I said, I absolutely have to photograph this. I didn't know what type of flower it was, and I still cannot remember, but it's not a rose. Um, does anyone know what type of flower that is? Can you see? No? But uh, anyway, it was, um, it was something that I had to do. Now, what I love about this is sort of an explosion of how the petals are taking um, their, their own form at the top. And I find dead flowers much, much more beautiful than, than live flowers, actually. So it's sort of morbid in a sense, but I think that, that there's a beauty in it. You know, they sort of reveal themselves with more depth in a way take a different form so this was during the snowstorm <laughs> in prospect park last year i went out and uh i, I got some beautiful images uh during that so and again you can tell it's very grainy and uh there's some from the scans there are some imperfections and stuff which lend itself to to this which i find beautiful so do you mind if we open up to a few questions while we're going through some of these i want to make sure we have a little bit of time for that sure as well absolutely. i'm yeah. just looking at the time sure um, does someone want to grab the mic? And we can kind of, we can still yeah okay. if you would like sure. to, but it's the hardest thing you're going to do all day. <laughs> all right, do we have a question? Yeah, in the back. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm just always interested in hearing a little bit more about the part of your journey in which you went from it, like being in Florida, saying you had little to no money, and were nearly homeless or homeless, and then like making money from your art. Like, what were some of the key steps in between those times? Okay. Well, good <laughs> question. A lot of mistakes. Absolutely, a lot of mistakes. Um, so basically what happened, I, I won't go into too, too, much, too much depth of it, but it was a relationship which led me uh, that way. Um, being young and um, just, just young and, and, and exploring, making mistakes, doing certain things um, kind of uh, led me down that road. And um, what happened was um, I was in a relationship where I was just kind of just throwing my, my life away. I had one job after another, and I wasn't really trying, being really truthful to who, who I was as a, as a creative person, as an artist. And I would, for example, um, I can't cook worth a shit, but I would take a job as a cook, okay, for example. And then I would come in. This was like at, like, Denny's or something like that, one of those grilling places, right? And where orders are coming at, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? So I would just quit you know, the job after one, two days. And then I was always searching for that something, that something. And uh, at the time, I was um, also into working out a lot. I was into bodybuilding and this sort of thing or whatever. And um, that was like my whole world. It's all I cared about. So I was working out and trying to keep a job. I'd go from one job to another. I was working landscape maintenance. And, and meanwhile, trying to support myself, I was with this girl in a relationship. We broke up, then I found myself, uh, I went over to Miami with her and she left me. And then I ended up coming back to the other coast. I had nowhere to go. So I had a friend who had an upholstery shop and he said I could sleep on the shop uh, table there. So I would do that at night while I was still training and I had this kind of driven uh, direction of wanting to be this bodybuilder and da, da 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 and all these other things. And then I started to really take a step back and say, I'm an idiot, okay? I'm sort of chasing this notion that I'm going to be this bodybuilder and uh, all of this. 
when the fact is I just really needed to get back to the truth of who I was. And fast forward to just say 12 years ago, for example, how did I do that? Well, what I did was I started to come up to New York making connections here and networking with people here who were in the flow and doing their thing, meeting the right people here. And I would literally jump in my car, throw my equipment in the back, drive up, do a photo shoot, throw my shit back in the car, and drive back to Florida, like within three days. I, I, could, I could make it here 22 hours from Florida to New York, do my shoot, sleep a couple of hours, four or five, and jump back in the car and drive back. And that's what I was doing at the time. I hate to fly. I mean, still to this day, I go to Europe every summer, but I hate to fly. So if I could have control, I don't care if it's more dangerous, because statistically, you know, flying is more dangerous. But as long as I had that control, I was okay. So, and then more and more, what would happen was I was making more and more connections, the right connections, and getting away from repeating old patterns and habits that I, that I was making mistakes doing in the past. So, does that answer your question? Okay. Cool. You're welcome. And he, he actually did some work with Gilles Montezan early on, who you guys met earlier on in the semester. Yeah, Gilles, in fact, I, just a quick little story. Gilles, I was in Florida. You know how I met Gilles? I had my portfolio with me, and uh, I, go, I went into Saks Fifth Avenue uh -huh. to get ready for a fashion shoot. And um, Gilles was there with his partner, Andrew. And I started talking to him, and I think his collection was, was being premiered there Sex, yeah. from Sex in the City, because mm -hmm. his, his clothes were in Sex in the City, the first and second, I think. That's uh, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, uh, hey, my name is Mark, and this is what I do, and would you like to see my work? He said, sure. I went out in, in the car, and I brought my book in, and, I, and he liked my work, and he said, when you're in New York, let me know. And I said, great. So I flew up to New York, and I said, uh, hey, let's get together, and I did quite a few shoots for him, and uh, that's how it all happened. Um, it just was weird that way, but I kind of have, I don't know, that sort of luck, I guess, I don't know. So that's what happened. All right, we have another question in the back there, if we can. Hi. You got, yeah, turn it up. If you speak closely, you have to. Hello. There oh, we okay. go, perfect. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, do you ever worry about objectifying your human subjects? Or is that the fun of photography, interp interpreting them through your own vision? You know, this is a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question. And it is so ironic that you ask this because, um, you know, with this, um, with all that's been happening in the media lately, particularly with like, let's say the Me Too uh, generation, right? or I don't even want to call it a generation, movement or whatever you, you might want to call it. Um, as a fashion photographer, I came into the industry with my own notion of what, let's say, sexy was or glamorous or um, edgy and all of these things. And as a male, uh, I would interpret that a certain way. And I was approaching my subject in a way in which I felt that the industry would say was sexy or appealing. And what that meant for me a lot of time was, okay, nudity, we take off the clothes or we keep the pants on or we go, we do a topless shoot, but beautiful hair and makeup or, you know, we want to edge it up and this is what we want to do or we put just the jacket on the, on the female model or whatever. And, um, and it was most always, you know, female. Um, and more recently, I was just talking to my wife about this yesterday, and I said, because I still get emails from agencies, and they want to know if I want to shoot models that they have, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I really don't have any interest, because I see it as a little bit too exploitive sometimes. How to remove myself from that, and still pick up my camera, and say, I want to photograph this person in a way that I can have a meaningful connection without shooting them, without photographing them, and feeling like it's an exploitation. And the reason why this came to my mind is because I was on the platform, uh, the subway platform, taking the F train, and I saw a, uh, a girl, I don't think she was a professional model because her boyfriend was taking a picture of her with his iPhone, and she had a bag, and she was dressed, and she was posing, I don't know if it was for her Instagram or whatever, but she was kind of, um, it was kind of this sexually suggestive way, and she was throwing her hair back and all of this. And that's what 
kind of prompted this thought in my mind and I said, I don't want to do this anymore, you know? So it's very interesting you say that. But to answer your question, I haven't gotten to that place yet, but it's definitely a journey which I'm interested in going on and seeing how can I get to that place without feeling like it is exploited because so much of the industry is. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question or does that? I think so. So you do think about it. And oh, entirely. Especially, I have a daughter. I have a seven-year-old daughter. I'm in a different place in my life now. And that's why I welcome uh, fine art. I welcome... You know, I welcome that and, and, and to see where, where it leads me um, because I think we all go on sort of this evolution um, in, in our creativity, hopefully, you know, if we're, if we're reaching to that place. So, uh, you know, that poses those questions. Um, I think that's very important as a creative, I guess. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you for the question. Another question? Yeah, up here in the front. Hello. Um, I had a really quick question. What was your first big break? Where that moment where like, ah, oh, I made it. You know, it's all very deceiving. <laughs> um, when you look back, and I was, I was talking to Joshua about this uh, earlier today as well, it's sort of a collection. It's a, it's a moment of collective um, times when you, when you say, I made it, but you don't know it at the time. Um, I thought I made it when I shot for Italian Vogue. Did I make it? No. I heard crickets. I shot, I, well, I shot for Shin Magazine. I did the cover. I thought I made it, but I didn't. Um, I thought I made it when I shot for that, cal that magazine in California. I think it's called Flaunt because um, a lot of advertisers watched that magazine. It's an American magazine. It's, uh, a lot of people knew about it on the East Coast as well as the West Coast, but I didn't make it. I thought I made it when I did a fashion shoot in Paris uh, for a client there, and I didn't make it. You know, It's like a lot of times we, I think uh, it was um, the actor, uh, oh gosh, Ben Kingsley. He said it best. I mean, it's nothing to do with, or seemingly doesn't have anything to do with what we do as, as uh, maybe as a photographer, but it was, he said, you know, sometimes we kind of have this, we're like hunters, you know, and we look around the room and we say, you know, who are you and where did you come from, you know, and, 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 and how did you get to the place where you are, you know, and you want to sort of prove yourself as a hunter, you know, as a hunter gatherer as he put it, you know. But what happens is, you know, the elders, as they call it, they come to you and they say, hey, listen, here's your bow. I want you to pull on that for a while, you know. And you're pulling on the bow, but there's some resistance at first. And you say, I don't want to pull on this freaking bow, you know. What, what, what is this all about, you know. And eventually they give you an arrow and they say, you know, just practice with the bow and the arrow for a little while. And that might be several years in your life, in your career, you know. As long as you stay in that moment of pulling on that bow and using that arrow and finding what it is that you're trying to express and what that truth is for yourself, you're finding your way to what I represent here, for me anyway, um, with my fine artwork, less, uh, less so with my fashion. And eventually what happens is over that period of time and that period of years and so forth, the elders will then come to you and say, okay, now you're ready. And you'll say, no, 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 I don't want to go. I just want to pull on my bow and my arrow because I'm having so much fun with it here, right? But it's at that point in time when you're ready to ride off, so to speak, with the, with the greatest, you know, or, or what people may call the greatest. And you may fall flat on your face, but that's okay too, you know? You're in the mix, you know? And, and that's what I think is most important. So this notion of making it, you know, it's really a false nomer, in my opinion, you know? Um, you, you go out and you, you, you do what you do from the truth of being of who you are, and hopefully that resonates with someone. And I think, like, one of the, the best um, representations of that, say, for example, was Steve Jobs with the iPhone, you know? He created something we all didn't know we needed until it was created, and it's like, wow, you know? So when you come from that place, I think... Um, then you're doing a good service to both yourself as a creative or as an artist um, and the world around you. That's just my take. So, All right. Can I do one more question? Yes, we, do, we have. Question. Any advice on making connections in the fashion world as a fashion photographer? Hmm. Any advice you'd give when making connections? Yes, absolutely. Um, when I was, the most profound, I think for me anyway, I, I could say um, there are several, but... 
um, there was, and I gave this advice, actually I saw the other day someone had posted something online and a guy was a photographer, he was looking for uh, some help with a fashion shoot or something and I contacted the guy and I gave him, I have a list of over, I'm going to say about 500 connections in, in the industry with publications, um, commercial uh, connections and so forth and I sent it to him and I'm like, go for it man, you know, go for it. And there's one thing I said in the email to him, which, uh, which I'm going to repeat here, is I, I met a photographer once when I was in Miami. His name is Greg Lotus. He shoots for Italian Vogue all the time, Beauty. I mean, the guy, he's on all the covers of their magazines. And um, Bruce Weber lives in Florida as well. And I think that Greg was, um, I think he's good friends with Bruce. But once in my career, I was shooting with a model, a male model, actually. And I came to find out that he was Greg Lotus's partner. And I didn't know that. And I'm thinking, why are you choosing me to shoot with when Greg is your partner? You could shoot with Greg <laughs> any time, you know? And so, um, but anyway, long story short, uh, I, met, I met him and I was shooting at his house one day and Greg came home. And at the time, I, I didn't know uh, who he was. Uh, and then I later found out who he was. And Greg said to me, I asked him, I said, you know, could you give me some advice on, uh, you know, how you came to be where you are in your career and everything? And the one thing he just said to me is keep shooting. Just shoot, 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 keep shooting. And at the time, I thought, you know, well, okay, you know, I can do that. I've got a digital card in my camera. I can keep shooting. But what I feel is, though, because I can look back 12 years later and say, what he truly meant was to go on that journey to find the truth of who you are, unwavering. And as you're going on that journey, you just kind of bring in that spice of this, that little bit of that. And if you're any good, the industry will respond to what you're doing. And if you suck at what you do, they will respond as well and you will know it, and that's it. You know, you can't put a, a square peg in a, in, you know, in a round hole. So you adapt a little bit, and you say, okay, they're not responding to this, what can I learn from what I just did, my failure, and then just keep shooting. So it's just a matter of just continuing, and never give up, you know? So, and if there's something there, um, you'll know, you will know. We have time for one more, so up here in the middle. Did you still have a question? Hi. Uh, so my question is, how do you feel, you know, you mentioned like iPhones and people shooting on the platforms and stuff. How do you feel that social media has impacted photography as a career? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, at least from my perspective. And again, anything I say today is again from my perspective. Um, you know, whether someone agrees with it or not is a different thing. Um, it has um, affected the industry immensely. Uh, in fact, what happens is that a lot of times um, companies want to now get content, you know? But no one's talking about the quality of the content. You have a lot of, I, I saw not too long ago, a, it was from an agency, I don't know if it was like Next Models or something, but there was this posting on social media and the agent said, you know, okay, when there's no more Instagram, you'll no longer be a model, you know? Because what it is is that now you have all these Instagram models. So they might have millions of followers and what happens is because there's eyeballs on whatever he or she is wearing, a lot of advertisers say, ah, here we go, you know, take our, our stuff and wear our stuff. And what's happening is the quality of photography is going down because you only have to produce an image that's maybe one centimeter by one centimeter that is getting eyeballs on it, you know? So I, I feel as though it's impacting it. I mean, it's a tool like anything else. It, it does have um, its upside, but again, um, I think that that's where things are being driven now. And that's why perhaps advertising agencies are having to rethink you know, um, so. We have a lot of designers in this room and I'm curious as maybe sort of a last uh, or an end to this, um, what advice would you give them in terms of the design process or how to sort of think about the world that, that works for you or that you think would be useful to them as they're getting ready to go out into their careers? What I would always say is just to be truthful to, to who you are, your voice and your vision of, of what it is that you're doing. And don't let uh, the market, don't let your, your parents or your grandparents or whomever or friends or, or whatever sway you from the direction in which you inherently uh, are going in for yourself. Take the advice, you know, take the advice, yeah. But when you have that something, that, that something within you that says, I, I feel as though this is what 
is me, that, that uniqueness about you. I think that's what the world is waiting for because everything is so watered down nowadays, you know? I rarely see original content, uh, and I'm sure you feel the same, you know, out there. Um, and that's what I would do, get back to, to that. Shut out the noise, you know, and just create from within. And you'll find that there's something there that's very special for every one of you. And I would love to see it. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you thank here, you, Mark. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, so we'll see you next week in the Katie Murphy Amphitheater. <laughs>